My stage name is Mr. Servon. Tell me about the neighborhood you grew up. Where'd you grow up in New Orleans? I grew up in Uptown New Orleans, Third Ward. Um, it was more or less like, you know, corner six of Barone, which one of the greatest um, New Orleans groups, UNLV, they made it famous. But they were like younger than me, so, but they were the guys that made the block where I'm from famous. So six and Barone, that's where I come from. What was it about six and Barone? I mean, I know how that song came about, but was it just a really important crossroads for people? Is where everybody went to the block cars and second lines? What was it about Six and I mean, all the second lines had passed up there. You know what I'm saying? They came through there. They came through that block up on that corner. And that corner, if you look at it, what it has spawned money-wise, you know, just the contribution in New Orleans. Myself, Tyler Perry, he grew up on that same block and was... He didn't really hang on that corner. He was on the other side of the corner, Six and Barone. You had two sides. You had the hustle side, you know, where things happen, you know, and you had the other side where just was the kids just play around on it. You know what I'm saying? So, and then you had UNLV. So it was just that that corner, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that everybody was at and you, you, you grew up there. You When you were small, you saw, sit on the porch, you saw, as we say, you know, what the older soldiers, you know, gangsters, whatever, on that corner, and you just wanted to be on that corner growing up. You know, you come from doing whatever, school, whatever, you just want to hang on that corner. And that was something that we considered our stronghold. That's where, you know, we not from the project, which was three blocks away to Magnolia, you know, we from the houses. And just as tough as they were, we wanted to make sure we was just as tough and we, we held on that corner. We held that corner doing tough days. You know, I would say the bloodiest days that growing up in New Orleans, you know, you we made sure that that look, this is us, this is where we at. You're not gonna disrespect that and, and UNLV more or less when they rapped about it because they lived it even more than I lived it. You know, it even got worse once I left from around there and moved away. The they grew up on it and it was it was worse. You know what I'm saying? So when they did songs about it it was just it was real. And you know, name they name UNLV uptown niggas living violent. So, and that's that was that was that corner. You know what I'm saying? That was that corner to be. That was the place to be. It is rapping, whether it was hustling, whether it was just hanging out, whether it was females. When you're a block or two, as we used to laugh and say, we two blocks from St. Charles Avenue, and then you move over to St. Charles and Garden District. Okay, that's paradise. That was considered perfect. And then. You're three blocks from the Magnolia, two blocks from St. Charles. So it's like you're right here, you're between heaven and hell, as they, as they used to, we used to joke and say. What about um, block parties? Can you tell us about a block party in the neighborhood growing up that you might remember? Uh, I mean, I remember a lot. I mean, because we had around there one of the, on Dry Street, Dry Seven and Drives, we had a bar called Newton's. And a lot of rappers started there from UNLV. DJ Jimmy, he also, you know, was from around our way, he lived on Washington, but he was around us. You know, Jubilee, which is what, you know, the bounce scene really was popping off. That was one of the main clubs holding the walls. And, you know, you would have block parties around there. You would have block parties along our blocks between Drys and Danielle. I mean, and, you know, you just, you had to be musically, you know what I'm saying? If that was your dream, that club was deep. That ball was that spot where dreams were made and dreams were taken. Anything could pop off at any time. You know, this is where all the hustlers in the city, they came and made money. And, but then the rappers like Juvenile, you know, when he was bouncing, you know what I'm saying, doing the you almost, know, you know, bounce rap at the time, but rapping also, cause he always had that skill. So he he was in there, you mean, you name it, they were in there. You, it was like, go for it in a room, no bigger than the room you're in right now. You know, so, and those are things I remember when you had those parties, you know, Jimmy up there, you know, Jubilee coming all the way from the tent ward from out, out to St. Thomas and Juvenile, the Magnolia, you know, you're thinking UNLV, my, you know, my people, all them in that one place. And you look at all them naughty legends. So, and they all were in that little bar, you know what I'm saying? And a few others that, you know, I might have missed, you know what I'm saying? They, they all came to that spot and that was in that same area within the blocks, you know, circumference. What about um, musicians in your family and musicians in your neighborhood? When well, you were up when you were little? I mean, for me, 
you know, we had we had several musicians that 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 you know I realized as I got older, like how important they were. You know, going. I mean, I I know that my neighborhood names. You had people like Wallace. You had um, my cousin's husband Norwood. He was he was a uh, he played the bongos and he played and and he was a Indian chief. Something I was young, I didn't understand too much and then didn't see the importance. But him and my cousin, which was his wife, used to babysit me a lot because my mom worked a lot and things he would teach me. Okay, who is this person on the wall? And grow up and learn that's Bo Dallas Senior. You know, the big chief, you know, I mean, you you learn, you know, people introduced me to Bo Dallas Jr., his son. We grew up together, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the things that he taught me, then music, and he never knew it would shape my life because he played the bongos, which when you look at it, and always was beating on some. He played the drums and bands and, and, and the French quarters and things like that. And um, we had a few people out of our neighborhood that was, you know, in hot eight at eight and different things that you grew up with that now you realize, like, that same person coming home from high school playing the trumpet or sitting outside playing his trumpet or playing his tuba or got his drumsticks, you look and like, you know, you just laugh about it. But then now it's like, for me, 25 years in the music and that culture is what made, helped make me, you know. So these are people, you know, a few people I grew up with around there that was in the music. When did you first start getting into music? Yeah, was it always rap, or did you do other things? Actually, I mean, I really, I always, I mean, I'm talking about since I was young, being around my cousin's husband, you know, had this knack for wanting to do music. But the funniest thing about it was, I used in rap ways, I wanted to be Russell Simmons. I, I never wanted to be LL, but I idolized LL. And the thing about it is, and I'm talking about always sixth, seventh grade, just listening, reciting, and always feeling like, okay, you know, I don't really want to stand in front of nobody and perform, but let me be the guy to put it together. And as time went on, you know, it was just more or less like high school, start getting deeper in the rap. You know, me and a friend of mine who I played basketball with, once I left St. Augustine High School, I went to Coin, which was in my neighborhood. And a friend of mine, Frank Jackson, we, we was, before the dances, we would take double cassette radio and then another radio to um, tape recorder. And we would like really make our own little, from just little segments and seconds of the song, our own uh, basically little Thanks. beat to be able to, yeah, no, to be able to rhyme to because it was like, yo, we're going to get up and do it. We're going to get up and do it. And we would practice all before the shows, Fat Boys, you name it. I mean, LL, whatever. And we practice, and then when we get to the high school dance, he was ready, but me, I didn't want to be in front of it. But I would talk, DJ, and they're like, man, give us 30 seconds. You know, and he would do it. And I wouldn't, because I would always be like, nah, never mind, once it was time. And when I got to, you know, left school, and I ended up in, in the military, you know, um, being on the East Coast, I love where I'm from. I used to get in fights about being from down south, you know, and and from New Orleans. And I always tell, used to tell guys up north from New York, like, we're the same. And, you know, y'all wear polos, we're polos. They're like, no, you don't. And I would come up out with my, my clothes, you know, come, they had my clothes and we'd get ready to go out and they're looking at me real funny. And I had such a deep pride and they would be talking about rappers and, you know, rappers. And I'm like, we only have one, which was Gregory D at that time. And it was like, oh, we don't know who he is. And, so then my mindset changed and it set in the anchor and I was like, okay, I'm gonna learn what I need to learn here. And when I'm done with this military thing, it's like, you know, New Orleans, we gonna get there, you know? And it's like, I learned, I sat down and just learned and learned and learned and paid attention, listened to all the groups. They would go to have New York, artists would have shows in Virginia and I would go and just watch. And I remember, which set the tone later, you know, I guess it was as we talked, <clears throat> watching Karis one perform. And I never wanted to perform before. And somebody tried to get on stage and he was like, if you touch the stage again, this is my world, this is my life. I work hard to get it. You touch the stage, I'm gonna beat you down. And they attempted to touch that stage. And when he stepped on his hand and he moved his hand, he was like, 
you came to see me and I came to give all of me to you. Don't disturb that. This is all I got. This music is all I got. And he said that. And I was staring at him and the funniest thing, in the same crowd, they were visiting Virginia. Somebody from down here that I ended up hooking with, up with later. Didn't meet him that night, but they were in that same show. And that changed me where I was like, you know, not only do I want to just put this together, but that's what I want. You know, I mean, they didn't get mad. They didn't jump back on the stage. They respected and they kept rocking with him. And it was just like, and he was like, cause I'm from New York. And when he said that, I was like, I'm from New Orleans. And it's the same. You either respect us or we make you respect us. And that's where my mindset started coming to see. When I get home, this is what I want to do. And I don't want to just be king of that neighborhood or in that little spot that I told you about Newton's and rocking that and everybody know I want the world to know who I am. I want the world to know my city. And that was the beginning of my mentality with that. So when you first got together with um, KL and Parkway Pumpin', was that after the military? Was that before? It's no, that school? was after the military. And he was the actual the person, him and Dot, they were visiting and they were in that same show. And I didn't know. They were with a friend of ours and I didn't even know he was in the show. And they saw that same show and that's who I was speaking about. And what happened was when I got home, because I actually, I got put out the military. I got put out the military three days before I was actually supposed to get out for speculation of drug distribution, which, you know, I'm not going to deny. I, you know, military money was good. I loved the military. Everything was fine. I just made mistakes being young, and I wanted, I wanted more. I wanted to do more, you know what I'm saying? And made that mistake, got put out. Um, when I came home, um, I was into a lot of things. I, I was just... I had a different attitude on life and I was hustling, I was doing whatever and doing it at a very high level. And it was just, and a friend of mine, you know, close friend of mine who used to be on that corner, who kind of made it out, was doing well. And he was like, look, you gotta go to school. Why don't you go take music? You know what I'm saying? You coming home, I'm listening to you. Cause I would be rapping in the car and my other friends would be like, shut up. I didn't want to hear that. And my dude was like, nah, keep doing it. You know, and he was like, why don't you take music? And he took his income tax and he paid for me to go to Suno. So when I get to Suno and I, I felt different because I was coming from living on the East Coast. You know, I was dressing different, sound different to them. And everybody down here were mostly bounce, bouncing. And for me, I, you know, I rapped real up tempo, real fast. And then language and words was different. So it was like, I went to a cousin who was a manager of a artist down here, and he was like, oh, you'll never make it down here. Oh, you'll never make it. I'm like, okay, cool. Get this soon. I walk into UC one day, just been going to classes, and they challenge him. And there's MC Dort from 3-9 Posse, and just going at it. And they're going at it, and I'm like, just remind me of the East Coast where you got to earn your way. And jumped in a circle, handled my business, and I was like, okay, you know, cool, walking off, you know, and Dog was like, it's funny, he was like, yo, you know who I am? And I'm like, and it was funny, I used to play this stuff, and like, yo, I told you we rapping on the East Coast, like they used to bust down, everybody from here, Kirby Dean, he's like, oh, whatever, whatever, you know, and I'm like, dude, I used to play y'all stuff a lot, and he was like, hey, you say, you going uptown? I'm like, yeah, and I was driving, because I was hustling, I had it. He was like, yeah, he said, um, we were talking. He knew I wanted to rap, and we get on a park where he said, I just needed a ride. And I was like, oh, okay, you won't, you know, you do the actual ride. You didn't have to play it like that. And we laughed, and he was like, well, let me bring you, you know, into the studio. So I come in the studio, and I'm like, wow, this is the parkway, you know, parkway pumping records. And then I meet KL. Was it still in the basement? Yeah, yeah, in the basement. And it was so funny, you know, we just sitting there, and... Dog was like, I think he kind of nice, you know, he just come back, so rap a case, so I rap. And he was just like, just saying, he didn't say anything. And then he was like, what time you can come back around here tomorrow? And I said, whenever you need me. And when I came and he was just, he broke me down. Like, I didn't know anything about bars. I credit him the data who I am. 
you know, I didn't know anything about bars. It was like I would rap all the way through or something. You know, didn't worry about where the place to hook, you know, and then tempo and, and learning how to breathe and change. He sat there like continuous, even through me running in and out, hustling, doing things. And it was like he taught me every step of it. You know what I'm saying? Sound and, and that's where I met him at. And that was the beginning of that. And then I'm confused about the, the timetable here, but didn't you go to California with Kale and Mia? Okay. Was that, tell me that story. Um, Kale and I, Kale had at the time, and a lot of people don't know, and he, he's very quiet, he don't talk, I'll, I'll speak for him in a sense. At the time, you had everyone coming through there, and I want you to really imagine when I say all the names that come through there, imagine if we had that money and had that deal at the time. What power you would have. You had Mia coming through there in the basement. It's the first time I ever saw her. You had Fiends coming through there. You had Juvenile. You had Soldier Slim. You had me. You had, um, God, who else? Um, Mystical was there consistently because people, you know, the first, when he, that song that he did, I'm not the nigga Kale really did that first. That was the first. And basically, we didn't have money to the money to put everybody out and and get them out of there and stuff like that. And you know, you had to respect; they had to go their way. And he went to Big Boy, which was a good thing for him, you know. But all of them were there, and so it just left me and KL every night. He DJed at Rumors, you know, and which was a chance. Whenever we do a song or two, he would he would actually you know play it in there or whatever or not. And my actual first performance ever in life was under Soldier Slim. He, he performed and I was on the undercard and he was at Rumors, which was crazy packed. You know, that's when I really learned, you know, New Orleans, I'm like, we have it. You know, it's not just bounce. You know, we have it in the crowd and, and the way things work. And with KL, just, you know, to get what, what you asked me about, we, we had a hard journey. It was times where, you know, he was like, look, you gotta stay out the streets. You can't come around me if you keep doing that. We can make it another way. You know, we can pray, go to work, do something, bro. Just don't do that. So I, you know, I wanted it that much, and it was like I, I stopped, which means money got tight. You know, so you know, I, I, it's funny. You know, we go down to things where we laugh and joke, and I said on a song where all we had between us was honey buns and ruffles, and that's what we used to eat at night. You know, because he had kids. I had my daughter, my mom, so whatever extra money you had went there. And what was left was like, you needed eight tapes or whatever, whatnot. We had to, you know, take care of those, or track tapes or whatever. And that's how we ate. And that night, you know, it was go play basketball, blow up the steam and not making it right now and not being there. Then come back, eat that, and then do songs till four or five in the morning. And we had a friend that was like, look, do you want to go to Jack the Rappers? I'll get your music together, you and KL can ride with me. Little we know God bless his soul. He he was running big time drugs in the car. We didn't even know. And we out there, we go straight out there and we get out there and we didn't have no passes. And he was like, I'm gonna take care of my business. Y'all go to the conference. And me being me, and there's nothing to be proud of, it was like, hey, we gotta get in the conference. Some guys was walking and they were like they wasn't too interested and I asked them for their passes. Not so much of a nice way. And they, we got their passes and we was like, cool. We going in there, we looking for, at the time, we was looking for Dead Row, you know what I'm saying? Because they were gonna be there. We was like, anybody big, Jermaine Dupree, whatever. And the minute we finally get in there, we in there, we happy, fight breaks up. Luke Skywalker, you know I'm in Dead Row. And in between that fight, you know, you see Jermaine, we finally see him, but it's a fight. And he's, he was with this group, little group, Escape, you know, then. And we looking at like, like who want to hand him a tape? But it's like we all pent back because they fighting everywhere. And then I see three people that I know. And Kale was like, who that is walking up? You know, guns out. I was like, oh, they from New Orleans, they from New Orleans. That was P, C, Murder, and Silk. It was like, you all right, man? Come on, y'all all right? What you doing out here? Because I used to play basketball with them. Because I for a rap, huh? In high school. Grandma school all the way up. Uh -huh. I mean, I 
basketball was my life way before rap. You know what I'm saying? That's all I did. I played all Navy and and, and within the military where I traveled with their they team, their top team. And I saw them and we went to, I forgot the restaurant. And P was explaining to me about, you know, his label and this and that. And I was like, okay, man, here, I'll take, you know, if you like it, just holler. And about a month later, he called and he was like, I got this West Coast Bad Boy album coming out. And he came in town. He was like, man, check it out. And I'm listening to a song and it was a song I did called Gotta Get My Serve On. You know, which is where my name came from because it wasn't Serve On at first. It was C Rock or, you know, everybody have, you know, we all have messed up names. And, and because of the hustling I used to do, Guy out the parkway, big mo. It's like you know, you serve this, serve that. You serve on, you always getting your serve on. So cool. MCA had a song, "Gotta Get My Serve On," but you don't hear me though. And I, we took that and we made that into a song. I'm listening to the West Coast Bad Boy album that P had. They took the hook, open to get my serve on, but y'all don't hear me though. I'm like, damn, we just. And he was like, man, come mess with us, come, come do this. You know, I got you. I'm like. Okay, we'll see what's up, you know. I'll give you a call because I was kind of a little angry by it. Like, okay, damn, but okay, but we on the record, dude. We on another one, so fine. Me and Kay was like, and shit got crazy, and I just went back to hustling. And when I went back to hustling, got into it with some people, and they came to my mother's house at like 5 in the morning. She called me and said, don't come home. You know, two people at your door, one on the side. And I called P and he was like, and I told him, he was like, if you can make it to the airport, I got you. And I got to the airport, flew him, he flew me to Oakland. He went to explain about his deal and everything. And I didn't know it was that big that he had a deal with priority. And he was like, man, I'm putting this album out, Down South Hustlers, I won't come home, I won't get. And he, so he already had, a, you know, Bumby and Pimp C and all them on it. So I'm like, cool. And so we get back down. And he was like, he wants some New Orleans artists. And I mean, he went, I guess he went to Peaches and he met Mia and he hooked up with Mia and he was trying to talk to a few other artists in New Orleans and they wasn't, they were, New Orleans artists are so stubborn minded. You know, they like, they like New York artists. It's like, it's about right here. I'm not worrying about over there right now. At that time, it was like now, everybody from New Orleans, they wanna blow. But at that time it was like, I'd rather be the king of New Orleans. So they didn't believe him. So we believed in it, and it was like he brought us out there for Christmas. He kept his word. He was like, "Man, I'm gonna give you 2,500 a song." I'm looking like, got a daughter, kid out the same way. Cool, you know. He kept his word. We did it. Bought his chains, and he was like, "Man, just fuck with me, you know. Just on the street level, let's let's, you know." He was like, "All right, you know, you kept your word. We went, came back home, you know, Mia. It was just me, Mia, and KL." You know what I'm saying, at that time. And that's where we got, you know, KL and Mia knew each other from that, that rap circuit. I got to meet her, which was, she was a great influence on me, you know, at that time. So that's how we got to Oakland, at that part of Junction, the story. And then you came back, um, well, backing up, what, tell us the story about the Miller kids. Like, you know, you play basketball and everything with them. Is there a story that stands well, out in your mind, with, um, you know, earlier? It's funny because it was like I went down the line. I uh, used to play at Napoleon in camp, and you had to really earn your right to get on that court. You didn't just come up. It wasn't about, okay, we're not going to allow you to play over some toughness. No, you had to have game. And PNC and brother Kevin, who was like 6'6", six, six, played for one Eastern. I mean, you know, Fortunately, he was murdered later. To me, he should have went on to bigger and better things. I used to just idolize him, just run behind him. And he would, I was smaller, he would always, you know, be there to protect me, you know, whatever. Like, yo, you all right? I got you. Come on, play. I can pick you on him, you know, and would spend time with me balling. And then P would always come. And then I would see him, and it was still more like being around him a lot, you know. And my my family was in the Calio, so when I would go by my cousins in the Calio, I would see, you know, P, but P was, P was playing ball and P was hustling at the same time, trying to provide for them, you know, and then, you know, it was like after his brother, his brother was murdered, of course, he went to California, which left C here, 
and C was, you know, which is my guy, I'm close to my age. We played ball, we just hung, we was always around each other. And the funniest thing, you know, when you look back at it, you know, the best story I can really sit back and it's more relating where I got into it on the court with someone and he was known for running to go get guns. And I was like, we can fight, fight right here. Run to go get guns and I'm like, and he ran to his car and at the same time, P walked up and P was like, you got a problem? And when he saw him, he saw P, he was like, he went back to his car, got in his car and left. And he probably would have shot me, probably would have killed me because he wasn't gonna fight me. And it was just funny when you relate all the way back to Jack the Rappers in the middle of this melee, who's the first person I see? It's P. You know, and he was always like that. If I was in the Cali or playing ball at Rosenwald and, you know, not being from there and you get the best of somebody, they get mad. He was always there. You know, and he's in, you know, when my situation came up and they're looking for me. First person I called at five in the morning, it was there, he was there. And it, it's funny to see how him and C's relationship, because it's always been the same people in the media talk so much about it, like to now, today, uh, recent occurrences and with them. But they've always been, you know, when we was in Oakland, just driving, you know, they get in a fight. C, P is driving, C in the back seat. He's swinging, P letting the wheel go and swinging back. And it's like, really y'all two doing this? And you stop on the side of the road, they fighting. I try to stop it, not they brothers. So I try to stop it. I end up on the ground, not they mad at me. Acting like, it's like, and then you just like get up like, man, I'm dumb, y'all, whatever. And two weeks later, they could again. And his they, they relationship has always been like that. And mine has always been intertwined with them because P always looked out for me, but C was my guy, you know, that I hung with, you know. And so when them two get into it, it's, man, what y'all stop, man? And it's like, I'm there, you know, and it's always been that type of relationship, so. Certainly don't say anything that you're not comfortable with, but there's lots of talk about um, C coming home soon. Yeah. Yeah, Is there any I rarely that? smile, but yeah, he, um, yeah, I can't really speak about the specifics of it, but of course, you know, he didn't do it, and, and, and people say, well, that's your guy, and I know him, and I know his heart, and I know, and this young man was 16, God, you know, his soul, I'm sorry, you know, that that happened to him, but his fans, and, and young dudes, especially, if you ever wanna, if you ever got to know him, you would know he was the type, if you were young and he see you a knucklehead and you like, oh, see, I want to look like you, this and that, and you'd be like, chill. Then pull you to the side and joke with you, laugh with you, and at the same time tell you, this is not the life you want. You know, I mean, and him hurting someone, I'm, I don't care, I don't care, he, you know, someone young like that and someone that as I was told was an aspiring rapper and wanted to and see was like never. You know, I mean, that that's something he would not do. And everyone has tempers or whatever would not, but that's something he, he didn't do. And then there's other circumstances that I know that he didn't. You know, and you know things have now transpired and, and so much of the truth and things are straightened out and which I, you know, can't really speak about, but he will be home, he will be home soon. And, and the thing about it, his mindset, what everybody's expecting from him, you know, you'll get your Samaritan music, but you'll get, you have a person that's so much, so different. And they say, oh yeah, jail makes you different. But when you're an innocent man and, you, and you've been there that long, and you, you know, haven't been able to raise your kids. It's a difference in him that I think society and the community will benefit from him walking out those doors. He has a mindset, and he's been doing some of it through others, you know, with community stuff and helping and different things that he he wants to do. That I think once he comes out, you know, which you know, it's going to be a good situation. You know, and I think, and then, you know, so it'll be soon, you know, and then, you know, of course, you know, we waiting, but I think I'm more waiting for him to come out for his daughters. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they, they, they've remained strong and 
with you know, and I think they they need their father. So that's the best part of that. So when you guys came back here, what was the first point that you realized? Okay, this no one thing is going to be a really big deal. I think New Orleans was so closed in, and the funniest thing it was like, like in New York to win a crowd in New York is hard. And we did this show at the Riverboat Hallelujah and so many people showed up. And, you know, the Washington Orleans like show up and you're like, wow, okay. And they still played us off, you know, it's funny. And we got back and P was always good of a businessman where he's not gonna say, he's gonna show you. So he was like, and he came down and he was like, yo, um, you know, y'all did some good work up there and I was, it was doing Mardi Gras and, you know, I had my jacket and nobody really knew what it meant. And it was like, it's at a friend's household, Jeff Davis, watching the Endymion Parade. And he was like, yo, I need to talk to you. I'm in town. And he was like, I told him, I said, you won't be able to get through. He said, I'm gonna get through. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna park on the other side of Tulane, I'm gonna walk. And I told him where I was at and he walked up and he was like, he, was, he gave me, you know, this I'm on a limit tank and and he was like hey I put this money in your pocket you know and I was like and I didn't you know I knew it was a little you know but I didn't know it was a lot and he was like man he said I need to see you and KL and um you know we definitely gonna talk because we, prior to that um he had producers out there and he wanted us back up there to you know what I'm saying and you know, so he once he gave me that, and he was like, um, "I want you to come back up there. I want you guys to come like up there and get your apartment. You know, you guys and get y'all straight or whatever, what not." Basically, me and Mia, and KL was going through some some little legal issues. You know, where someone used his name and they committed crimes, and it was like he really was dealing with something, getting that straight. And me and Mia was already up there, and. You know, you didn't see much then, and then I jumped back to that, you know, coming back to that night, and, you know, and he walked off, and he was like, it's, it's that time, you know, and you know, I was like, okay, all right, and he was like, oh, by the way, your song made the soundtrack. I said, soundtrack to what? He said, oh, you got to go by Carlos, and I need you to redo some of your vocals and get that song done. I'm like, what? He said, soundtrack to the movie The Substitute. I said, I didn't know it was going to a soundtrack, and he was like, Oh, yeah, because I didn't tell you, you know, might have put pressure on you. You just did a song and we like it. You know, I'm like, okay. So, you know, you're just sitting there and I'm like, just a while, you know, and at the same time, I pulled this money out. And legally, that was the most money at the time that I ever made legally for something I done right. And it was like $10,000 cash. And he was like, I'm looking at it like, and I just talked to KL earlier and he was like, oh, I need to get some gas. And I'm like, I got a few dollars, man. I'll see you after the parade. And it's just like, you're looking at this, like, and I'm watching him walk off and I'm like, and my song just made a soundtrack. Like, you know, and you're just sitting there like, it's happening. It's really, it was uh, bang him up. It's the first time you're gonna hear PC, uh, because the hook is bang him up, bang him up. And at first I was just, me and C. Murder was just going bang him up, bang him up. And he was, and he got on there and was like, bang him up, bang him up. Uh, it's the first time you ever hit that. And it was just like, you sitting there and it's like, and I go, met KL, like, you know, here. And he was like, what you doing? I'm like, I'm doing, I swear. And he, P was like, he just came. He's like, you serious? I'm like, yeah. I'm talking about going up there. And when, you know, we get up there and he was like, well, what's up with K? I kept saying, we got to work with K. We got to work with K. And in between, he had came down and he, and we had been working on on this sound where K was working on it and we wanted something different. And for me, my blueprint of going back to thinking like Russell was like um, Wu-Tang. You had all those members, they did one album, and then only one other artist would put an album out, which was Method Man. Now imagine if all of them put albums out, then they would smother the industry. And 
what we thought about at the basement years before when they had the mysticals and everybody was putting all them out and just smothered the industry where they can't breathe. Every time you want to put something out, we have two. And it was like a homie. And it's funny, we met who? No Lemon Records and Tank and it's homie. So we always had that in mind. And we always was like, okay, we go up there, we got to come back and get everybody. And, you know, and keep that same thing. And then when we was doing the song, me being on the East Coast, I liked Onyx. And it was like, you know, see how they bring their rowdiness, you know, but the beat was faster. And Kay was like, listen to this. And he played about it. And it was just like, at the time, it wasn't about it. It was funny. The name of the song was Bucking Like a Winchester, but it was for me to talk about where I've been. And, you know, I'm like, that's it, you know, listen to this. And we just listening and it was just like, you know, you like, that's, 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 that's the sound, you know, do, do crazy stuff over it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I always talk our language, you know, not like Onyx talk theirs, but like Onyx rough, you know, just wow, just, and talk our language. And when we were up in the apartment, we used to talk New Orleans, you know, a lot in front P and P had been gone a while. And we would be like, Oh, you're not about money, you're not about, you know, females, you're not about this, you're not about that. And he was like, What the hell talking about? And we're like, Oh yeah, I don't got him and C Murder was saying we like, Man, you gotta be about it, P you ain't about it. So him being him, it stuck in his head, like, okay, that's some real shit to say. So when he got home he needed to do a commercial for Q ninety three because he was trying to acclimate himself in the New Orleans. And K played that, and, and P, what well, people don't know about P, I would put money on him any day freestyling. He never write. He's never, every song he's ever done, except his Miss My Homie songs, which were deep to him, he never write. And he would sit there and he just constantly, and he was like, you know, about it, about it. And he just, because if you listen to him, he said about it different. We would be like, man, you ain't about this, about that. He was like, about it, about it. He was like, he pronounced it because of his Cali accent for years. And once he did that and that commercial was doing well, but knowing P was like, New Orleans, okay, cool. He said, I'm about to get a world. And he went and he did the song up there and, and a lot of the cities, the cities I traveled to with guys from the military and I always promised him, hey, I'm gonna put the city on. And if you listen to a later album of mine, I did a song called Throw Your City Up. And I named those cities and those are the same cities you hear about it. And P was more or less like, I'm gonna put every hood on, on this one song. And he did it. And it was more or less, it was just a couple of us. And when we were up there, I was like, I said, man, we gotta go back and get K. And he was like, man, he had brought Moby Dick, his cousin up there producing. He was like, well, we got Moby. I'm like, yeah, we like Moby, Moby straight. We got love for him, but we want K. And him being him, you know, He's more than what, you know, to say he was a music mogul or whatever. He's the type of sit here and he would listen to you. And me and Mia made it at him. Like, if you don't get K, we going home. Without K, we can't, we not doing this. And he was like, all right, what's his problem? He was like, he and Court did on this. He said, go home, take care of it. Sent money for lawyers, take care of it, bring him back. That's what's gonna get y'all bring him back. And that's what got him Brought brought us back up there, and we were up there, and 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 it began. You know what I'm saying? Because you start seeing it. You know now he's taking us to L.A. to the party office, and you know, and then you start seeing we were doing shows, and it would might be packed for like two thousand dollars, and it's about five of us, six of us on the road, and he making sure everybody still had money. And once that he released. You know, we did the Ice Cream Man and he started letting Kale take over a lot of the production where he changed from the West Coast. He trusted, he was like, I'm gonna go with him. And when them two got together, that's Dre and Snoop to me. And you could start seeing once this, once Body came out, he did Ice Cream Man, which was done by Moby. But when he started releasing songs by Kay, it just, he started getting ready to play something we never got. We started, the shows were huge. And were the radio stations here, were they playing it from the start or is it like they now played a little. Like they played a little it. bit, you know, cause they were more bounce oriented, you know, and we weren't here. 
So, you know, we weren't considered like, you know, I think at a time like, okay, yeah, they're from here, but, you know, they didn't go through the, the rigors down here to, you know, whatever. That's, that was their mindset, I think, a lot here. And, and I think where it really hit us, like, we there, you know, when we was on, on the call of a show in Cleveland. And sad ending, but when I we realized we was on, on the call in Cleveland with Westside Connection, Skullface, and all them, we watched them go in. And we waiting, you know, with, but we had performed and we killed it because about it was Ice Cream Man was, you know, and you talking about 18,000 people in Gun Arena, it was Gun Arena then where the Cavaliers played. And and that near the end of Ice Cube them show, they start screaming, we won't pee, we want no limit. And you know, being a surreal moment and you're looking at 18,000 people saying this and some of the greatest to do it, West Side Connection with Ice Cube, Skullface, they all performed, but they at the end of the show screaming and we like, damn, wow. And it got more surreal when we sitting in the airport and that report comes in that, you know, you know, basically, you know, that that's when Biggie got killed. And, you know, we had lost Pac. And Pac and P was like this. And we were still just coming in, you know, and then you lose Biggie. And it was almost that thing. And I remember somebody, security made a joke. It was like, you know, damn, we the last gangster rap that's left, right? Like, talking about it. It's our time, and you look at the situation of Park on the West Coast, Biggie on the East, South is in the middle. They go, we come. And it was like it was like that surreal moment where you know where you sit back and like just just about to get real. You know what I'm saying? They still at war, East and West. They got their beefs now. Biggie's gone. It's gonna be worse, and. And time has showed they start paying more attention to who killed who and who did what and stopped making music on both ends. And all that left was us. And we were coming at that time because we were more in the streets. We were doing it the old way. We were doing it the way Rap A Lot did it, the way E-40 them did it, who P learned a lot from, you know, being, you know, rap hustling from Two Shot and all the people he was cool with in the Bay. We were in the streets. We were you know, we'll come to your record store. I don't care if you tell us, look, it's in the rough reserve in Cincinnati. We came. It was more or less like Pete thing was, why rap about the streets and you don't let the people in the streets see you or touch you? And that, that to me was when I really realized, like, this is about to be real big that night. And sit, well, sitting in the airport that night with the chance and then sitting in the airport that morning. So. When K.O. was on board and you started um, going hard here, uh, where did you record? When was the recording studio? What? When did the, you have multiple ones that you recorded? With No of? Limit? Uh-huh. <laughs> but back here, when everybody, when K.O. was on the ground, where, where were you recording out of? Uh, well, when we were, we really, when everything, it was more or less we were out in Cali. And we were using um, K. Lou, who was a, damn good producer for Too Short, E-40, you know, platinum producer. We used his studio a lot. We recorded a lot of stuff out there. We didn't start recording down here with No Limit until, you know, we was done with Bout It album. I mean, Bout It, the movie and all that stuff started taking off. And he decided, you know, it's time to come home. And we ended up in Baton Rouge. We never really did anything down here in studio, we all did a lot of stuff because we were in California for like a year and a half, two years. Even when stuff was starting to get huge, we still was up, we, we still were up there. What was your hangout spot in Baton Rouge? Did y'all have one bar, one place, one club that y'all used to go to? Um, honestly, we were different. We still that way. Um, P had a saying that, that we all, you know, we lived by that, that he would look at TV and see Puffy them and they partying and they doing this and they doing this. And he was like, when they party, you know, while they party, we work. And in the end, we'll see, you know. And 
he never was a club guy and I never was really a club guy. I did my clubbing thing. I would get in trouble sometime, you know, where it was like serve, serving there somewhere, you know, and, and my thing was I just used to be there because they used to say, well, we never see people from No Limit. So I just go in there purposely, me and see. And, but we worked so much, you know what I'm saying? Where it was more or less like, and that was all our motto. It became our motto, let them party, we'll work, and we'll win in the end. And we just really didn't go in Baton Rouge, I would say, we used to go on Southern Campus sometime, you know what I'm saying? And, and go to LSU, play basketball, and we did that because every day we did it as a family. You know, I kept camaraderie. Whether you can play ball or not at 4.30, you had to go together, everybody, and play. And, I mean, we might go to Churchill's and smoke a cigar or whatever, or not, or things like that. We really didn't go to too many clubs in Baton Rouge. We really didn't go out because we were always working. And when we wasn't working, we was flying to, to cities to do shows. So we didn't... You know, rags every once in a while. I can't lie, I snuck to these places, you know. And something always pop up, not with us. And then it's like people, like, who was there? Sir. See, you know. And, you know, he would fuss. And then so he figured out a way, like, okay, now I'm going to keep them with me. And that's how I started learning the business. Because he was like, okay, if you're not here, they're in New Orleans in club, especially me. You know, you know, when I wasn't assigned to be working, you know, I might dip off and I'm like, okay, I got three hours studio packed. I'm coming to New Orleans, I'm coming to me. And so you got to the point where, and then you got used to not being in clubs and kicking it. You know, you're just like, all right, I'd rather be doing something, learning, watching KL and mix and learn that or, or trying to get on a song because it was so much competition. You know, you had 15 rappers in one room and P doing his album and he come out, he's like, yo, I got a second verse, who won it? And you went to walk for it. You you spit your best and everybody get a chance. And then, you know, Kale and would say, okay, let's keep such and such on this song and that. So you didn't want to miss anything. So going to a club, so going clubbing too much, you might miss out being on some big songs. You know, so that's how that was. Were people, there are some stories that people were really horrible to them when they first started buying houses in the country club in Baton Rouge. Was there a lot of... I think Baton Rouge, and, I, and, I, and I'll say this, and I'll say it with honest <laughs> sincerity, Baton Rouge still lives in a racial way. Because, you know, the Klan was right down the line, wrote at Denham Springs, and I'm sure it was in Baton Rouge. And you look at people in Baton Rouge, they grew up, they call it the bottom down there. And you would meet somebody from Baton Rouge, just when I realized it was nothing like New Orleans, where you meet somebody and they're like, yo, we on college drive. Oh no, we ain't coming over there. You know, police be true. I'm like, and at first when we got there, they would, I didn't think they were used to seeing, and I'm being honest, black people in nice cars. And they would stop us and they were, oh, okay, it's no limit guys. They got to the point where they stopped stopping us because all our stuff was legit and they realized we were there. And I remember going in the country club by P and you just seeing the look. Cause we, we carried ourselves different from what people, we always say, yes, we were rappers, but we were businessmen. And when we were home, that was with our family and we don't jeopardize that or whatever. But you can tell that they didn't want him in the, in the country club. They didn't want black people in the country club. You know I mean? They didn't, it was just, the, the things they did and it wasn't like this place was grand like if you say you're going to East over before the storm or or English Channel or whatever you know I mean I've seen better houses in, in the um, Garden District than in the country club it wasn't all that for the money they asked and, and all of a sudden they stepped up on their rules when, when we stopped moving in there and but literally they know it brought up and they wouldn't admit it later that it brought the value of the houses up because the bigger P got and the more money he made and the Snoops and everybody that came there, you know, that became, hey, you can live somewhere near them. And then they took advantage of that on their own also. You know, but Baton Rouge, I think, wasn't ready to see, honestly, to see young black men with money living in those areas, you know, because we had an area where we lived at where people are like about 
15 houses where a lot of us live. We mind our business. We was with our families. But you can tell, you know, you could walk. I'm walking in Albertsons and the younger people like, oh, that's Sir Von A. Hey, what's up? You know, he always comes shopping here. He cool with the older people. And the difference in Baton Rouge is down here, I could walk down the street and older, white, young, hey, what's up? How you doing? All right, what's cool? You know, keep going. And it's not about, oh, I know who he is. No, we just like that in New Orleans, in New Orleans. Not Metairie, Jefferson, Kenner, you know, whatever. But Baton Rouge was like, what you speaking to me for? And you saw that and, that, and that gave it a point where we understood, like, this is where we live with our family. Don't have nothing to say to any of them. You know, they don't like us here. Fine, they're not used to us. We're not going nowhere. We live here. We live nice. We live well. We don't cause problems. We're not going nowhere. And you got to that point where this is where family was at. And you, we, that made us close as a label because we stayed like this. And, you know, and that was some of the reasons why we didn't go to so many clubs sometimes out in Baton Rouge, because all the DJs was cool, DJ Boosies, Marquises, those were like great guys and cool. But you can see the establishments they worked in and police would be out there real packed before they let out stopping them, whether you're drinking or not or however. And you just like being from down here, you not, you don't see that. At least one or two cars might be around a major club around here and all don't. You know, and they're not bothering you. You know what I mean? And it's like you saw with Baton Rouge, it was like, and if they decided to come across College Drive, I think I forgot one of these bars that was near Hooters, and they would have like a little club thing um, on college and just to see how the police was and how they act and what they did. But I can go right at the bottom, as they call it, on Plank Road and all that, you know, in Baton Rouge, and you barely see a police car. You know, so why about news? I mean, I think it's a stupid with, question, but you know why? No, it's not. Problems? It's actually a very interesting because people said that. Well, why not here? Distractions, family, you know, trouble. Um, with Bad Rouge, it was more or less like I can get them out of. And I hate to say it, me and C was really one of the reasons because we had apartments in Georgetown. And that's because, you know, growing up down here, it was like Georgetown at one time was that. Like, okay, if I make it, I won't go live in Georgetown. And got in the issues, got things happen. And he was like, y'all gotta get out in New Orleans. So he was like, he found the best apartments possible and paid for them for like a year for us. And it was like nicer than Georgetown could imagine, you know, living in there. And he wanted us down there because I think he foresee, you know, because I had an incident at a club, Whispers down here. And, it was bad, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, C got into arguments and things like that. And he was like, you know, no. So he wanted Baton Rouge. And then his his family, put, you know, their family is so large. And, and he, he, you know, they were good guys. Him seeing Silk, they're doing anything for their family. So it was more or less, it was a lot of stress, you know. And even with mine and anybody else's family that was doing well, the mysticals, everybody, you know, your family's going to be like, hey, save me. And it takes away, you know, and he, he understood that and saw that, like, look, you guys are making money, giving you things. I want you to have it. I want it to grow. But your family going to take everything. And then the stress of friends and keep it real, hang here and there. And he saw that that was not going to be good if he got houses down here and, and you know, and he had cash money coming and, you know, it was more or less we grew with a lot of them, grew up with a lot of them, but music started separating that. And he saw that also when sooner or later this is going to collide. Did so, it become an angry rivalry or was it always, I mean, so many of you guys knew each other for so long prior to you, but did it become like a bitter rivalry or was it always just... It was never, angry? let me tell you something, it was never no rivalry and, rivalry and we'll say it like this. And... I speak my mind, and a lot of people know that when I do speak, you know, I mind my business a lot. Never was no rivalry. I mean, at one time I can recall coming out of a place in Houston where you do covers, and Baby and Slim was going in there, and they were talking to P, and at that time P, you know, if everybody liked to label on the streets about status is what you got. Well, P was sitting in, at a 600 bins, same car that basketball players had. 
and he was talking to baby, telling him what he needed to do. He was asking P, man, how you do this, what I need to do here, and, and he was talking to him. So it was fine, you know, and I think Cash Money and No Limit became the first taste of, we, we learned the taste of, I would say the media and magazine people and things that they will do because once they got their deal, you know, I think it got back to baby like, oh, P didn't want you at party and da da da. So, you know, you end up at Universal and, and the same person that worked P's contract, Wendy, worked Cash Money's. Best contracts ever made, both of them. And they're the same. You know, and Baby them came at a time after we had really blown up. So that I mean we put the stakes up. So of course they was gonna get more money. And the way the industry is, the industry breeds rivalry. Okay, we got no no limit doing that. Let's go see what else New Orleans got. And cash money was always there. They were always New Orleans, them and Big Boy. We were we started in California. So you go and you get that rival label and what they were doing and so then they get it and then these words get out and all of a sudden baby instead of hey P how you do this and you do that he over here like now nah, it's like oh I don't like them you know and P was the type I'm not going to talk about you on the album if I have an issue with you when I see you we'll talk about it and you know it was more or less like you know baby you go back to songs where like man fuck a thug girl I'm like a hot girl thug girl and stuff like you know and we sitting there like, okay. Baby from Cash Money and I went to school together. We played AAU together. I know him personally and his brother who passed and his brother Slim. We all went to grammar school at Holy Ghost. So you know somebody and you're like, okay. And he really tripping like, okay, with that. See Juvenile, we laughing and talking. He stopped by to see my mother. You know what I'm saying? When I'm not in town, you see Baby pull up two block, two two houses from my mother to his uncle and come down and kiss my mother but at the same time you know fuck the tank fuck this and that and you just sitting there and I'm sitting there like where is all this you know where this coming from and then you just the magazines and it's cash money and we like okay we good we soldiers they stun us they talk about partying we talk about what's real in the street it's room for both and you just really would you know and see BG well what's up we know each other everybody it was just P and Baby, it was that point where P was like, you know, be disrespectful, I'm, you know, whatever. And they ended up meeting, they ended up talking, and it wasn't all what Cash Money made it out to be. And, you know, and then Wayne was young then, and he was just a follower, and he you know, all this. But when he saw us, it was, what's up? So I wanted to ask you about life insurance. In 97, I think it yep. came out. So, um... What's your favorite song on that record? And can you tell us about recording it? Uh, Heaven is so close. Um, it's tied with like two others, but Heaven is so close because it was really the, one of the first songs where, you know, I, I, I kind of did what, what P felt I would be, you know, because Skullface and Pac was my favorite, Skullface, Pac. You know, a lot of and a lot of the deep stuff, you know what I'm saying? And dog stuff. That was because one of my first songs was called Before I Die on on a soundtrack. You know, uh and I love doing those type of songs. And because that just was me, that's what I really you know, I can say melodramatic or whatever. But it was like right around that time a little kid was killed. In the, in the project, James Dogan. And another one, Lil Manny. It goes back to, and I was thinking how much I love my city. You know, and I'm just like, we don't kill kids. We don't, you know, you kill who you mean to kill, if that's what it comes down to. But we don't touch kids. We had rules. And, that, and that's when I saw my city slipping, where it was like, you know, you growing up and it's not good, it's nothing to be proud of. You walk up on somebody, you kill them. You know what I'm saying? You kill who you mean to kill, but you don't just shoot and you kill. And that really kind of messed me up. And they used to always say, oh, you always talk about dying in songs or whatever. And I was just like, man, you know, at the time, it was like heaven is, is, is close. The way the, you killing kids, I mean, that I means it's getting shorter and it's getting closer. 
And, you know, KL was like, we used to joke about being in a band and stuff like this. And, and when he used, they kind of used like the sample that they use um, from Earth, Wind and & Fire. And it was just like, that's it. You know, and it was one of the first songs I didn't write to. Where it was just like, I'm gonna do it from, you know, just, you know, and that's when KL was starting to get, you know, because they had Pro Tools long before everybody. KL was just, he wanted to use ADAT tapes. He hated I'm not using that computerized stuff, now that's all they do. And he gonna hate me for that. But um, it's like, he was like, I got you, just do it. And if you listen to the lyrics of it, it's just more, you know, just sitting down saying, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm gonna be here. It was like first time in life where we made it. I dreamed of putting the album out. He told me it's my time. Do your thing. Do it the way you want to do it. You don't have to rap like you. You you have an East Coast style, but you have your downside dialect, your New Orleans dialect. He said, just be you. And it was just like, but I was in the mood because of those kids that I was like, I made it, but I don't think I'm gonna live long either. You know, and that was where my mindset was. And then, then I was losing people around me. So when I did the song, it was just, you know, and I did it and P, P, P came in and it was like, he said, I, I got the hook. You know what I'm saying? And that, cause that, 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 those kids, that affected him. And, you know, it was just like, on oh, something like, dude, we ain't promised at all, man. All this and it's like, if they kill a child and they, you know, what, what are we? And so I did it, you know, I did the song and I never really realized what that song was because it was just me letting go because it really bothered me and it was just me and Kay in there. And, you know, I'm mad enough to say it, 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 I cried because it was just more or less like you watching, you seeing these little kids and it's just like, this is not my city no more. I don't understand, you know, what's what that that's not supposed to happen. And you know, you're doing it and you're not doing it to make a change or an effect. You know, you just, that was the only way I can explain how I felt at the time. And when I did it, you know, we did it. P came in, he listened, he was like, that's what I needed from you. I needed you to reach. You need, you can give me uh, the hustling songs, you can give me the street songs, you know, but I needed that from you. You know what I'm saying? I needed that one. You know, we got to make them know we do understand and we care. And, you know, when I did it and I really never realized it until like even now you really, you know, you realize it a lot of years later when guys recite those lyrics and they telling you, man, that was the realest song on the album. That was, you know, and when I have to do it in shows and the look in people's faces, you know, when they're reciting those lyrics and because somewhere down the line and you hear when you get off stage, man, that song helped me get through. It helped me get through you know, losing my little brother, losing my son, losing this, losing that. And you like, wow, okay. That was really just about me feeling like sooner or later I'm gonna die because they're killing these kids. So, you know, might as well express how I feel. And so that that song was like that big, that song to me that defined, you know what I'm saying? My, fr my frame of mind when I should have been happy because I made it. You know what I'm saying? But deep down inside, I, I wasn't happy. You know, it was just more or less, I existed. And that was it. So. Well, so many people, I mean, everybody's lost people here. I mean, whether it's to the murder rate or to mm -hmm. incarceration or to wrongful conviction or to hurricanes or to, you know, all these things. How has it affected the music? Not just in terms of lyrics, um, maybe the sound of the music, performance, musicians themselves. How is it? What is the effect? You know what I think? And I hate to say this because tragedy, greatness is bonded within tragedy. You look at Mystical, he lost his sister. That was his heart. He'd been on a vendetta to just make the world understand him for years and look who he became. Um, you look at a lot of people, whether it's Michael Jordan losing his father, quit, you know, and just came back and just destroyed basketball. Um, I look at the city of New Orleans and I look at the musicians now. I remember at one time, they didn't care about being out here. They cared about just doing music and 
their friends come and celebrate with them and, and listen and whatever, whatnot. And it just stayed the same. Everybody stayed level. Well, we was getting better. Cash Money was getting better as artists. And you watching all this down here, they would just... But after Katrina and the destituteness of, of this city and the things, the, the artists that have arose from that and their change and the way they rap different. They, you know, they went other places and they saw it and they realized their story and their culture and who they were was idolized, you know what I'm saying, in other cities. Where it wasn't just the fact, oh, okay, that's New Orleans, you know, they'll kill you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they saw that too. And they understood that, you know, and you start seeing them, they rap better. Look at the 3D Nazis, look at, you know, um, the currencies and all the different, you know, young artists, my, my, my guy, Jason Lyric, I mean, different people we have here, they really rap. And I remember being on in, in the military, like everybody bounced and you had one or two rappers and I'm like, dude, if they ever start rapping on there and they tell their story, the life we live. And now you look at it where we have guys walking around with backpacks with hip hop. I mean, real hip hop, pure hip hop guys that will tear your lid off in, in a freestyle. And a lot of that, I think, and then they decide, I want to be big. I want to blow up. I want to buy my mama house. You know, I said in the song when y'all walked in, you, your first dream first is to get your mama out the hood. And then the next dream is just to be the best and put your city on. They believe that now, they show it, they rap for that now. They don't just look at it where, oh, it's cool. I know I'm, I'm the man in uptown, I'm the man downtown. It's like, nah, I wanna be, I wanna be Jay-Z. I wanna be bigger than P, I wanna be bigger than Baby. I wanna be better than Wayne. And then you look at the musicians, you know, Trombone Shorty has traveled so much. Now those stubborn guys that used to be down here and be like, oh, I'm not worrying about leaving New Orleans as long as I do my little second line and, and come see me at Snug Hub or whatever. I'm cool, you know, serve you in town, come check me out. Now you see them and they're like, hey, they just come from Paris and I got a CD coming out and I'm like, and I can smile, I'm happy because it's like, they understand. You see it now. Yes, you can do it for the love, but you deserve to get paid for it. You deserve to let someone else hear you because, no, we were not the best rappers, you know what I'm saying, you know, from, from you know, Cash Money and from New Orleans. No, we have some that didn't make it, and you know, but now we got a generation coming. And I saw the hunger because a lot of them, when Katrina, Katrina was big in a lot of ways outside of the tragedy of, of so many losing, they learned the lesson. I think a lot of artists from jazz down to rappers, you was doing all these little shows. You ride around in a little car or whatever. Not a nice car, the things that we had. And when you left because of Katrina and you find yourself in another city, it dawned on you. Damn, I'm so, I'm, I'm sitting in New Orleans, but I can't even pay for another hotel. Whole FEMA take care of me. I do nine days, I'm doing, I do 10 days straight and snug all the plant with my jazz band or, or, or at Chipotina's, I do the jazz fest, but I'm, I'm homeless. I think that made them, when they came back and a lot of them got right and got their house back or got in the house or got straight, their mindset was more or less like, I want it, I want more. I don't ever want to be able to be stuck and I'm, I'm so big here, but no one knew me in Houston. No one knew me in California. I should have been where, okay, hey, um, you know, I'm Jeffrey such and such. I, I, should have, I should have been able to say my name and musicians in those cities which should have came and said, hey, we got you what you need, you know, or you didn't even need to need anything because you had it financially. You know, and I think a lot of those artists and then out of those tragedies and then after Katrina and the murders and the changing of the guard, what I mean changing of the guard, these new teenagers with their murderous tendencies that they have going to other cities. And when they went to those other cities, you should never have to survive in America. And you're an American in another city being called a refugee where you had little young guys that wasn't in battle, they wasn't street soldiers here. 
but they went somewhere else and they had to be that way because they were from this city with nothing. And you look at some of them were young, now they're teenagers and they went through a lot and seen a lot and now they're here. And that's the bad part of what came out of it. But then what's spawning out of that musically is these artists that, you know, I went to a rap thing they had the other night for that sets full five who, you know, good guy, great guy. And he put off a thousand dollars in the way he was rapping. It, 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 it was um, at um, I think with Wild Wayne. It was at, at Republic. The other oh, night. industry influence. Yeah, industry influence. And I just stood back in the crowd because I was supposed to judge, but I was like, you know, Fiend was up there. Go ahead. I just wanted to watch, and it, it brought tears to my eyes because I'm listening to these little guys and the deepness, and to say we have such a low educational system, how educated their words were, how, you know, lyrically inclined and intelligent their lines were, their metaphors, and you sitting back and you like, and they hunger, you know, and it just bring me back 20 years when I tried to rap like that and my cousin told me, man, that never worked here. You gotta bounce, you gotta you never work here, man. That, that rap style will never work. And you look now, and I feel where it came from was none of these kids and none of these rappers ever want to be somewhere and they can't provide for their family. And I think that hunger came out of it. And even, like I said, even with the jazz musicians, you look at, you know, whether it's Soul Rebel and all of them, you know, Rebirth, they went in Grammys, they understand that what we, you know, where they look used to look at us like, oh, that's down, you know, they're not big in New Orleans, because we got that, you know, like, you know, and now I won't say the rapper name because I won't do that because we're good friends now, but he'll know, we laugh about it. And I remember him telling me, Shh, we sell records here, sir, you don't really sell records here. And I'm saying, what you sell here? 10, 15,000? I said, New Orleans, right? See, so, yeah, I said, well, I sold 3,000 in New Orleans. I say, but I sell 45,000 in Chicago, 40,000 in Cleveland. I say, however you want to go, it don't go a little, little more than 40 because I'm platinum. I say, no. I said, when you go somewhere, you could say my name and you're going to get respected because I worked hard and said I'm from New Orleans. You know, and that was the mindset with New Orleans artists at one time. Like, y'all big, so what? Everybody know my day. Yeah, we know them. But down here, nobody really, you know, they, they cool. They just do their thing. And we used to say, y'all gonna understand one day. And I think after Katrina, a lot of them found that, that hunger and that starving, and they bettered themselves. If you listen to artists down here, and even those bands that looked at Trombone Shorty, like, oh, he's traveling with Lenny Kravitz band, oh, he's selling out. And I'm like, you're not understanding. He's bringing New Orleans and making a place for y'all. All you gotta do is come through the door. Because we used to always say, we opened the door, cash money came through it. Cash money opened the door. Come on, it's there. Why BET came here? Why MTV bought the real world here? You know, why did they start shooting so many movies? Because No Lemon and Cash Money, they opened the door to say, look, it's more than just the murder capital. You know, we selling the most. If you really break down New Orleans and the home, look look up, look at the fume guys we got. This guy working his camera. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and he look like he can walk through any hood right now and be okay. Like he just he hood. But look what he doing. You know, that that was not a dream 10, 15 years, 20 years ago. You know, you look at it, if you put together and we we do some numbers and I'll challenge anybody in any city, and look how small our city is. Put every rapper that has made it. No limited cash money, they record sales together. And put Tyler Perry movie sales together. And then you put money, you're looking at $2 billion, $3 billion from one area of a small city, not even New York. And they cannot say that. California cannot say that. You know, and these are the two meccas. Chicago can't say that. And you really look at, you know, the transition that we've had going from being destroyed to where basically you have still, you have still like the top rap artist in Lil Wayne. I don't care what you think about him, whoever. He's still he's number still one. Number when one. you come out, it will be four, five million so mm -hmm. in a time like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you still have some of the top producers in KL and Manny Fresh. 
that's on the bigger, better things. You have somebody like Tyler Perry that does movies and if you talking about 50 million and he still does it the hustle way, where they'll give him 30 million to shoot the movie, he might spend 15 in the first week, he make 42. He done paid the bills, you know, and you look at all these little guys, like I said with him, doing show films. Everywhere I go, guys are with their cameras. They being, they, they learning how to shoot videos. They learning to adapt. And I think that came after losing everything. You know, and instead of laying down, it was like, we gonna take advantage of this. And the world, you know what I'm saying? They, one of the first segments of, um, where they show your houses on MTV, I forgot the name of it, Cribs. When we were doing, and nobody really told Joe Clare came, he was down doing Rap City, and I didn't want to do mine at a restaurant, me and C. We was like, we going home, and we let him in our house. You could pull it up, and we did. And the guy that was behind the camera, the producer, that shot it, he shot my cars, my houses, he did the same thing with C. He left BET, went to MTV, and he started MTV Cribs. So things that we believe in, you know, we have a, a stronghold that our young people starting to see now. You know, I mean, it's so much. You go buy a Cadillac right now, what, a Cadillac truck, a Escalade, or any car, what you have, a TV and a dash. Who said that? Cash money. Trucks come on 20s. Who said that? Cash money. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you got to really sit down the economic impact. And I think after Katrina, every musician that, like I said, the ones that hated trombone shot in, now they understand, oh, trombone is selling in London. We can get on the internet and send our jazz tape to London. Bam, we got a show. We in London, we in Sweden, we in, you bumping into, when I'm in the airport, I'm bumping into guys in LA that, wait, where I know you? Oh yeah, you, oh yeah, what you doing out here? Oh man, I'm writing for such and such, man. I met him one night, he came into to Blue Nile or whatever, you know, we was playing in there, we was doing this and that. And and I really think that's where that came from. Through tragedy, we grew. You know what I'm saying? We spawned this guy, we spawned these other guys that, you know, they really saw and I think they started understanding like, it's bigger, it's bigger than New Orleans. I can always come home, but you know what, I want more. And I think that's that's what came out of that. Where were you from, Virginia? I was living in Dallas, and my mother was like, she's not going to leave. Her brother was like, uh, you got to come. I'm the youngest. And I came down, got a hotel at the Queen Crescent. I think that's the name of it, right over here. And waited for my mother, waited. Went to pick up. Oh, I'm coming, I'm coming. Being stubborn like any other. She's 83 right now. So, and was stubborn then. And she didn't, she didn't come to the hotel and then the next thing you know she ended up at the Superdome and um, end up getting her three weeks because I couldn't find her for three weeks and the power of being and it's funny the power of being from here and being in No Limit I just put it out there I can't find my mother and got a call from a girl from Red Cross that was a, a fan and she found them at a Indian reservation thing in Georgia and guy that was another rap fan he was flying people and he flew my mother to Houston because I got to Houston and met me you know so but I was here and and that it goes back to like I said I used to I'll fight for my city you disrespect my city we we fight I didn't care you know you y'all don't know us and to see your city like that you know to ride up town looking for my mother and she's not there and the door open. And as you ride riding along, you see people floating. And one of the things that really, i never forget, it was uh, Claiborne and Martin Luther King. And this guy was just floating and his arms were wide, like open, like, honestly, like Jesus and his feet was crossed. My girlfriend's stepfather was, he filmed it. And, you know, the light was shining on him and he just was landing like he was basically crucified, just landing in the water. And you just looking at this and you like, it, it, you know, like this is my city. Look, you know, this, I was in the military, you know, I was in Desert Storm, you know, I seen things, you know what I'm saying? And you never, you know, 
thought you would see, you know, where you grew up at, where you played at, where you first kissed your first girlfriend at, you know, I mean, <laughs> just crazy things where you first smoked weed at, the, you know, coming from the Superdome dance, you know, that was a big thing when I was growing up, you know, it's like, it's destroyed, you know, you're I'm a Saints fan, you know, and you, like, where they gonna play at, you know, you, you, school's destroyed and you're just sitting back and you're like, and I'm seeing this, and then, yes, being financially stable at that time, but Lord knows, I didn't have money where you could say, okay, I can fix it, you know? And and I didn't care like other people. It was like, oh, George Bush haven't got here. You know, you know, you know how political red tape is and sitting there, you gotta sit back and watch and make sure he make the right move when he come. You know, and we wasn't as important. You would think it was because he partied and got drunk here before he was, you know, president a long time ago, whatever. But it was more or less like I said, you know, people like our city gone is never coming back. And my mindset was, that's a lie. I'm like, we're going to have to fix this. You know what I'm saying? We're going to have to do this, you know, not just as rap artists and artists, just as people. I said, it'll be back as... You know, and I never thought it would come back this fast. You know, and it's still not. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying, and I and I and I always say the reason why it is back in such a way because of the people, because of the culture, because what do people come down here and spend money for? Our culture. And if you didn't have those type of people from the end of the French quarters on. You know, all these hardworking people and, and the show, I always say that they put on every day, even if it's just smiling and saying, hey, what's up? How you doing? Oh, you from Houston? Oh, cool. Oh, hey, where can I get something to eat? Oh, you can go over here and go where they help each other out. You might know someone work at Daisy Dukes. You could send them to Commander's Palace in the Garden District, big time restaurant. No, we ain't doing that for you. I'm going to send you over here where you work there and I know you and you can get, oh, talk to Alex, you when you go in there, she'll take care of you when you get in there. I just help you out, make a tip and whatever, whatnot. You gonna turn around, I'm a bartender. You might come back and drink, bring your people in and drink. That's New Orleans. And that's what brought New Orleans back. And and I think even the music, because that's what people come here for. And I think if we didn't have all those things going, the culture, I mean, you no, know, this city wouldn't be halfway as that. Because I think and this city created memories for a lot of people in their life. You know, we joke down here in the CBD, we you know my little CBD friends that I've grown to be close to, you know, Vegas, God what goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. And we joke and say, make memories in New Orleans, you don't want to remember it. You know, and people really, you know, when you think about it, you know, people have some of their fondest memories in life coming to Mardi Gras, coming to Jazz Fest, or just coming here for a weekend. In, in the state of Louisiana, your rite of passage is so funny because being on here, I've learned this since I've been back home even more. They write a passage sometime coming from Lafayette. I just made 21, I'm going to New Orleans. It's like, that's gonna make me feel like I'm 21 because I'm coming, I'm going to Bourbon Street. I'm going to do this, I'm going in the French Quarter, I'm going. And it's like, I think if we did not have that, if we didn't have the whole city as a culture, you know, the Indians and everything that people come here, no, we wouldn't have made it back. And it wasn't just the money, because a lot of money was pumped into this city and they didn't get it. You know, asshole of a governor agenda. I look in the camera, look at you, asshole. He won't he won't win the presidency, whatever. Never. You know what I'm saying? Even if even if they wanted another Republican, you won't. You know, you crip with your state. You know what I mean? It's ridiculous. But you know, political agendas got all that money. The thing that brought this city back is the people. The music, the food, the culture, and that's it.